This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? I think you can. This is pretty good right now. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii is a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded 18 years ago to promote human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. Vegetarian education. It is among the largest vegetarian societies in the United States with more than 2,000 members. Tonight's show is being videotaped for broadcast uh, on the VSH weekly TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, this program airs on Thursdays at 6 p.m. on Olelo Channel 52. In addition, many of our previous lectures may be viewed online at the Vegeta Vegetarian Society website, vsh.org, vsh.org, and tonight's lecture will be added to that website soon. So you go to the website, you click on the second item of the home page, you click the lecture that you'd like to see, and on your screen, Lasting about an hour is the lecture and perhaps some of the introduction and some of the questions afterwards. You can see all of the slides. It's all there. Well, now it's time for our special guest tonight. We're delighted to have with us registered dietitian and nutritionist, Brenda Davis. Brenda has spoken here twice before. Ms. Davis is a leader in her field and an internationally acclaimed speaker. She has worked as a public health nutritionist, as a clinical nutritional specialist, as a nutritional consultant, and as an academic nutrition instructor. She is currently the lead dietitian in a diabetes intervention research project in Majuro, Marshall Islands. A co-author of six books, the bestsellers Becoming Vegetarian, The New Becoming Vegetarian, Becoming Vegan, Defeating Diabetes, Dairy Free and Delicious, and the newly released Raw Revolution Diet. She is currently working on her seventh book to be released in the summer of 2009. Tonight she will discuss Reclaiming Your Health, Lessons Learned from the Marshall Islands. Please welcome Brenda Davis. Thank you very much. I'm always so honored to be invited to speak here. You'll hear all about that research, but I hope that I don't just tell you a story, that I inspire you a little bit uh, with ideas of what you can do uh, for yourselves and your families and what could be done here. So when I, when I ask about the Marshall Islands, if people know where they are in the States and Canada, I get like one person raising their hand. Here in, in Hawaii, a lot of people know where the Marshall Islands are. And here's sort of what I do when I'm over there. I say, well, here's Hawaii. Everybody knows where Hawaii is. Here's New Zealand. Here's the Marshall Islands, about 2,300 miles southwest of Hawaii, about 3,500 miles north of New Zealand, about seven degrees north of the equator. Now, there are 1,200 islands that make up the Marshalls, with a total land area of only 70 square miles. 
I work on in Majuro, the big island of Majuro, which is 3.7 square miles in area. <laughs> Okay, it's also 30 miles long, and people at that point usually their jaw drops because they're trying to figure out how an island could be 3.7 square miles in area and 30 miles long. But it's got a population of 60,000 for the entire country, and half of the people are in Madro. And here we have what the island looks like, and you can see between the two black lines is the land. Okay, that's the land. Inside here is the lagoon. Outside here is the ocean. So pretty much wherever you live in Madro, anywhere along this strip here, you've got beachfront property out your front door and your back door. <laughs> this is De Lap, and this is where our, our uh, intervention takes place. This is where the hospital is. Okay. In the Marshall Islands, type 2 diabetes is an epidemic. It's the number one cause of death and disability. The prevalence is about 30% for everyone 15 years of age plus, and about 50% for anyone 35 years of age plus. And I would guess that the, for 35 plus, the prevalence of either pre-diabetes or diabetes is closer to 90%. Okay. About half of all surgeries done on the islands are amputations due to diabetes. There are no facilities for renal dialysis, so people that get to the point where their kidneys start to fail, which is a typical complication of diabetes, they have very little option unless they have a lot of money and can come to Hawaii. Was diabetes a problem in the past? 60 years ago, diabetes was pretty much unheard of on the Marshall Islands. People were slim, physically active, and they lived off the land. So what did the traditional diet look like? Well, basically you have whatever they could get from the sea, fish and other seafood, coconut, whatever plants grew on the island. They had coconut, they had breadfruit, uh, paley leaves and other green leaves bananas and pandanus up here, which most of you might be familiar with. So people say, well, what went wrong? How do we get from people that are living off the land 60 years ago that had absolutely no diabetes to 50% plus of adults having 35, 35 years of age and older having diabetes? What happened? And I have this picture of an atomic bomb blast saying something, it kind of symbolic of something big happened, but this also, f for those of you that know the history of the Marshall Islands, it actually was atomic bomb testing grounds for many, many years. And this island in the foreground here is one of the Marshall Islands. And many people in the Marshall Islands believe that diabetes is very simply a product of the radiation. Perhaps somewhat indirectly that's true, because one of the things that happened after the bombing was that people were displaced to small islands and couldn't get enough food to eat. And so food packages were sent to the people and a lot of what was contained in the packages were non-perishables like spam and white rice. And I think that started some of the changes that are responsible for the diabetes epidemic we see today. Of course, the lifestyles have changed considerably in 60 years. Now we see a number of bars and, and we see lots of stores and cars and, and all kinds of restaurants serving steak and, and cheeseburgers and so forth. And we also see a lot of changes in what shipped, things are being shipped into the island and they're not quite as biodegradable as the things that used to be discarded. If you know what I mean. But I want to just walk you through this. In the corner here is a picture of a little girl, and this is actually breakfast. It's a popsicle and a soda pop. And unfortunately, see the favorite breakfast of a lot of children is ramen noodles with Kool-Aid powder sprinkled on top. Uh, cookies dipped in Kool-Aid powder. Okay, and so the children are eating very, very poorly, and malnutrition is quite common. Lunch and dinner is almost always white rice and meat. So it could be 
chicken, it could be spam, it could be fish, but often it's also things like turkey tails or the parts of the animals that people on mainland don't want. So they take all of the parts that are, that are the parts they do want and whatever's left over they send to poor countries. This is a very traditional, this was actually a funeral meal, but it's a very traditional celebration meal as well. White rice and chicken, white bread ham sandwich, a donut, and some soda biscuits. And here you have a meal at the farmer's market, which is a big chunk of meat, big chunk of chicken, rice, and some uh, breadfruit with, with sugar and coconut things as well. And then over here you have just loads of these sweet beverages. I took a look at what people were eating, and, and here's a list of the top 10 sources of calories. White rice, white bread and rolls, donuts, white flour baked good, good spam and other canned meat, chicken, ramen noodles, soft drinks, fish, other meat, and salty snacks. You know, it would actually be fairly difficult to design a diet that would induce diabetes more efficiently than the diet that the people have adopted in the Marshall Islands and also many other islands in the South Pacific. That's why diabetes is an epidemic and has escalated so rapidly. The diet basically, what it does is it maximizes the components that really do people in, that are harmful to human health, and it minimizes the components that are the most protective to people. A lot of people say, well, it's just genetics. These people are just at high risk for diabetes. And you know what? That's actually true to an, uh, to an extent. They are genetically, like other island people and like Aboriginal peoples, they tend to be at high risk for diabetes. Be because people that have for many generations lived off the land, they're almost genetically designed to survive famine. You know, they need to eat few calories and exercise a lot to maintain good health. So, you know, these processed food diets and sedentary lifestyles will kill pretty much everybody. Humans are not built to exist on, on that kind of lifestyle. But it just kills Marshallese people, it kills island people, it kills Aboriginal people faster than it does other people genetics is very important in determining risk. But think back 60 years ago, was there any diabetes? None really to speak of. Was there genetics any different? I don't think so. <laughs> so the, the deal is, is that genetics is, is really like a loaded gun. So you're at high risk, but it is almost always diet and lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So now I want to move on to tell you about the Diabetes Wellness Project and how this came to be. Well, first of all, there's a group called Canvas Back Missions. These are a, a group of people who have been providing uh, medical teams to the Marshall Islands and Micronesia for many, many years, for over 25 years. And they literally watched the diabetes epidemic unfold and desperately wanted to do something to help the people of the Marshall Islands. And so what they ended up doing was coming up with a research proposal. And they actually, the proposal was accepted by the Department of Defense in the United States. And so they got some money to do research. And the research basically was trying to prove that diet and lifestyle intervention could make a difference for the people of the Marshall Islands. Islands. The partners in the project were the Marshall Islands Ministry of Health and Loma Linda University. So here's the team. We showed up in 2006, and this is the initial team. We've got a lot of other members as well, but this is the team that showed up to do the build-out, they called it. And the build-out is taking an old building and turning it into a diabetes center and creating the program. Okay, so here's the team, and, and you can see me there. This is my husband, this is my son. So they joined me. My daughter was in the midst of university, so they joined me for the first five months of the project, which was really nice. Here's our medical director and our project director and, and a, a student helper. We were given a large facility right beside the hospital, right here, to build our center, and it was actually the TB and leprosy clinic to the day that we took it over. 
So they just literally were moving out as we were moving in. And we cleaned and cleaned and painted. We had stainless steel medical cabinets with an inch of rat droppings on them. It was really a lot of work. And then when that was over, we started screening participants. And so we screened participants, and the participants that met our requirements to be part of the study were then randomized into either control group or intervention group. Well, you can imagine people that wanted to be part of the program who got put into the control group. What a control group means is you do your usual thing. You get the usual treatment. And so a lot of people were very upset. So what we did was we allowed everyone that was assigned to control group to be part of intervention as soon as they were finished being a control. So everybody got a chance to be part of the intervention. So that worked out very well. Basically our goal in this, in this project was very simple. We have one goal and that is to reverse the diabetes epidemic in the Marshall Islands. That's our goal, that's our target, and that's what we plan to do. Step one, we had to prove that we could do a program that would work for them. Step two, the program has to be adopted by the Ministry of Health as standard of care. Everybody receives it that becomes diabetic. First of all, I should tell you, the program began as a six-month program. What we found is that it worked better as a three-month program, but more intensive. So now it's a three-month intensive, intensive program. Weeks one, two, four, and six, people are with us for four days a week, six hours a day. Weeks three, five, seven, and eight, they're with us twice a week for about five hours a day. And weeks nine to 12, which is month three, they're with us once a week for five hours a day when they're with us. So here's what the intensive schedule looks like. Okay, people, actually what we do for the intensive phase, for those four weeks of intensive, they, we give them three meals a day. Okay, so we, we teach them exactly what they should be eating. But we actually give them breakfast to bring home. So the way that they do it is they do a walk first thing in the morning, then they do what we call a finger stick, which is just you poke your finger, get a little drop of blood, and see what your blood sugar is. Okay, so it's a blood sugar test. And then, and then they have breakfast, which we've given them. Then they come to the clinic. All of what you see in green is at the clinic. Okay, so from 12 to 1, they have lunch at the clinic. And then from 3 to 8.15, they come back to the clinic. So they're actually able to work some during the day. Their work day is cut a little short. But they come at 3 o'clock and they do an exercise class. They do a cooking class. They do a walk. They do a lecture. And all throughout that, they're getting their fingers poked. So they're, they're getting a lot of blood sugar testing done. Okay, so it's quite intensive. Now the goal of the diet, again, is very, very simple. We want to overcome insulin resistance and restore insulin sensitivity. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of insulin resistance. Okay? Type 1 diabetes is a disease where the, the cells that make insulin stop working. Okay? And so you need to inject insulin because you're not making it. Type 2 diabetes, you're making plenty of insulin, at least for a long, long time after you're diagnosed. So it's not a problem of not making insulin. It's a problem of insulin not working properly. Okay, so you make plenty of insulin, but your body's resistant to that insulin. Okay, so the first step in type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. And guess what happens when insulin doesn't do its job? What's its job? It's like a key that opens the doors of your cell to let sugar in so that you can use sugar for energy. If it doesn't do its job, sugar levels start to go up and up. And so you get this thing called hyperinsulinemia, which means you're pumping out a lot of insulin to try to keep up with all that sugar. But eventually what happens is your body just can't keep putting out enough insulin to allow the sugars to stay below a critical level. And the critical level is 100 milligrams per deciliter. Soon as your blood sugars are at that, fasting sugars are at 100 milligrams per deciliter, you have this thing called impaired glucose tolerance or pre-diabetes. 
And then you end up with this thing called defective glucose recognition. Your pancreas fails to recognize all the sugar that's floating around in your blood and doesn't pump out all the insulin that would be needed to handle it. Okay, and that's when you're diagnosed with early diabetes. And at this stage, your fasting blood sugar is at least 126 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so that's your fasting blood sugar. Now, what can happen is if your pancreas is overworking, trying its best to put out a ton of insulin, eventually the beta cells or the cells that make insulin can start to die or conk out. They just don't work as well. And that's when you can end up with this thing called late diabetes. And often you see people with type 2 diabetes on insulin. Now, the good news here, there's some good news. At this stage, especially, this is a completely reversible disease. You don't hear that very often, but it is. Because all we have to do is restore insulin sensitivity. We need to reduce insulin resistance. And this is a very possible thing to do. We do it all the time. It's not that difficult to do. And then if you do that, you can reverse this whole trend. So to achieve the desired goal of reversing insulin resistance and restoring insulin sensitivity, we need to produce weight loss because the excess body weight is something that contributes to insulin resistance. We need to improve blood sugar control. Very, very important. And in the Marshall Islands, generally blood sugar control is very, very poor. As a matter of fact, we had people walking into our clinic with sugars between four and 600 milligrams per cent on a regular basis. And, and with those kinds of sugars, if you were in the United States, in Hawaii, you'd be put in the hospital. Very, very important. We need to reduce inflammation. And there's a measure of inflammation called HSCRP. This is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is just a measure of inflammation. We've got to get the numbers down because it's very hard to reverse insulin resistance if your body is a lot of inflammation in your tissues. Okay, so we have to build a diet that is an anti-inflammatory diet. So now I want to dig inside a little bit and talk to you about the specifics of how, what the diet looks like and how we do this. And tell you about 10 sort of guidelines, 10 principles that we follow in constructing this diet. Principle number one is we use minimal refined carbohydrates, okay? Very simple. Most of the Marshallese foods are refined carbohydrates. Most of the carbohydrates they eat are refined. I'm going to tell you what they are in a, minim in a minute, but I want to tell you why we minimize refined carbohydrates. Very simple. They promote overeating and obesity. They adversely or negatively affect your blood sugar control or what we call glycemic control. They increase insulin resistance, which we don't want. They reduce the protective HDL cholesterol or the good cholesterol. And they increase triglycerides. Okay, so we've got to get rid of the refined carbohydrates. So what are they? What are refined carbohydrates? Well, they are basically high carbohydrate foods that have been stripped of everything that is of value to human health by food processing techniques, okay? And they include two categories of foods. Sugars, like white sugar, brown sugar, corn syrup, whatever, sweet beverages, candy, so forth, and starches. The white rice, all the white flour, and the products made with white flour. And what I, I, another thing that's important to understand is it's not a matter of complex carbohydrates being good and simple carbohydrates being bad. That's an oversimplification that's actually not accurate because simple carbohydrates are very good for you if they come from fruits and vegetables. If you refine wheat to make white flour, you basically remove the germ and the bran, which is where almost all of the nutrients are, right? The germ is a storehouse of nutrients for the kernel of wheat. And in the process, you remove 80 to 90% of the fiber, 70 to 80% of the vitamins and minerals, and 95% of the protective phytochemicals. And then what do you do with it? Do you eat the bowl of flour? No, nobody eats a bowl of flour. What do you do first before you eat the flour? 
you add shortening and sugar and salt and and if you're doing it in a sort of food manufacturing factory you add preservatives and chemicals you add a bunch of stuff that is actually very harmful to human health so not only do you strip the food of all of the good stuff you add a bunch of bad stuff first before you eat it it's impossible to build a diet that supports and sustains human health when you've removed all of the goodness from it first and add a, added a bunch of things that are harmful to you. You can't do it. So we can't build a diet on refined carbohydrates and expect to prevent disease on that kind of diet. It just doesn't happen. Unrefined carbohydrates come from vegetables and fruits and grains and legumes and nuts and seeds. They come from whole foods and they're packaged with fiber and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals and antioxidants and things that protect your health. When you have a disease, it's kind of like your house is on fire and you really don't want to be pouring gasoline on the fire. When you eat foods that are harmful to you, it's like pouring gasoline on the fire. You cannot reverse insulin resistance when you do that. You cannot reverse disease when you do that. If you look around the world, wherever people are eating processed, refined carbohydrates, they do very poorly. The second important point is we need the diet to help us with our blood sugar control. Remember we mentioned that? That means we need it to have a low glycemic load. And what does glycemic load mean? It means how a food will impact your blood sugar. Okay? And so we want it to have a we want blood sugar to be evened out. We don't want to have these great big spikes in blood sugar. And so our focus is on low glycemic index foods like non-starchy vegetables and beans. So a lot of our meals are bean and non-starchy veggie based. Like for example, bean uh, and vegetable stews. Uh, those kinds of things are very popular. Or a big raw salad bar with things that are sprinkled on top. Often legumes and all sorts of nuts and seeds and things like that. So we limit the serving sizes. So for example, if we serve barley or brown rice, we dish out a half a cup serving. And in the Marshall Islands, when people eat rice, say their white rice, it's often four cups. They load their plate, it's a heaping plate, and then everything else goes on top. We very carefully select our grains. We use mainly intact whole grains when we use grains, like barley. We minimize the use of ground grains. Do you know what I mean when I say ground grains? Flowers. Okay, because when you grind a grain, you increase the surface area so much that it gets absorbed into the bloodstream very, very quickly. So, and the other grain we eliminate is puffed grains. Again, they dissolve just like like sugar or, or high fructose corn syrup water. They just dissolve and are absorbed into the bloodstream very quickly. You have to remember, when you puff a grain, you puff puffed wheat or puffed rice, a lot of people look at them, these are really whole grains, but look at the processing that's been done, 1,500 pounds of pressure to get a grain to puff, you lose a lot of nutrients in that process. And then they just dissolve and get absorbed very, very quickly. So those of you that look at brown rice cakes as the ultimate health food, not so. It's absolutely not. Yes, it's low in fat. Yes, it's low in calories. No, it's not a health food. We emphasize the lowest glycemic index grains like barley, which has a glycemic index of 25 or 26, relative to rice, which has a glycemic index of 55. Now, the rice that is used in the Marshall Islands has a glycemic index of 83. Calrose white rice, sticky rice. Guess what the glycemic index of sugar is? 68. <laughs> Okay? So bad news. A lot of people come in and say, oh, all they have to do is replace their white rice with brown rice. Well, guess what the glycemic index of Calrose brown rice is? 87. People go, pardon? How can that possibly be? Well, it just happens that the glycemic index of rice has more to do with the type of starch it contains than with the amount of fiber it contains. It's the amount of amylose versus amylopectin in the rice that makes all the difference. So what we need to do is go to a lower glycemic index rice.
And I won't go into that anymore, but if people are interested in that, please go to, there's a website called David Mendoza's Glycemic Index Glycemic Load. He has the biggest list you've ever seen in specific types of rice. And you can find a decent low glycemic index rice in that list. So what is the glycemic index anyway? It's just a numerical system that tells us how food will affect our blood sugar after we eat it. Okay? And what it does is it looks at 50 grams of, so you need 50 grams of carbohydrate from a certain food, and then you watch the blood sugar for two or three hours after you eat it. So the, the deal is with this glycemic index is that there are some foods that it's actually hard to eat 50 grams of carbohydrate from that food because they're so low in carbohydrates. So celery, you know, very, very low calories, you'd have to eat, I don't know how many heads of celery to get 50 grams of carbohydrate. A lot. <laughs> and, and so the glycemic index isn't always the most perfect index for measuring blood sugar because of that. So that's why we talk about glycemic load, and I'll explain that in a second. But anyway, with glycemic index, foods are, are compared with, with glucose, which has a glycemic index of 100. So this just shows you the glycemic index of some foods, and I, I know I, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but just to show you one thing here, pasta, 35 to 45, bread, 70. It doesn't matter if it's brown bread or white bread. What matters is how heavy the bread is. So if you have a really heavy pumpernickel that you have to use a saw to, to cut, that'll have a much lower glycemic index than a light fluffy brown bread. But you can't look at this list and say, oh boy, chocolate has only a glycemic index of 49 and watermelon has a glycemic index of 72, so I'm gonna enjoy chocolate for dessert instead of watermelon. Okay, you've gotta look at, well, how much saturated fat does it have? What are the value, what, what's the value, how much vitamin A and vitamin C and all the micronutrients, what value does it have for my health? If you look at the glycemic index, it measures the effect of food on blood sugar. The glycemic load does the same thing, except it takes into account the amount of carbohydrate you're eating. Watermelon, for example, has a really high glycemic index. Anything over 70 is a high glycemic index. It's got a glycemic index of 72, but the glycemic load is only four because a slice of watermelon has only six grams of carbohydrate. So you could eat a big piece of watermelon, and it, it, the glycemic load at four, anything below 10 is a low glycemic index. Check out carrots, same story. They, they got a glycemic index of 71, but their glycemic load is only 6.4. So you really need to take into account the amount of carbohydrate you're eating, and not just look at watermelon saying, well, it's got a high glycemic index, I should never eat it. Now, I just want to very quickly show you this. If you look at all the whole grains, for example, you say, well, which ones are good, which ones are not so good? The very top of the hierarchy, you've got the intact whole grains, like barley and oat groats and quinoa, things like that that are intact. There's nothing added. There's nothing taken away. That's the best way to eat a whole grain. Next down would be to break up the whole grains, then to roll them, then to shred them, then to grind them, then to flake them, and then to puff them. Okay, so as you go down, you're destroying more and more nutrients. You're increasing the glycemic index. So number three on the list is the diet needs to be very high in fiber. 35 to 50 grams a day. Fiber is extremely beneficial for people with diabetes. It improves blood sugar control. It improves hyperinsulinemia. It increases satiety or feelings of fullness. It reduces blood cholesterol levels. It improves your gastrointestinal health as well. But lower, generally, if you look at the, the standard diabetes recommendations, usually you'll see 20 to 35 grams of fiber a day recommended, and, and sometimes just 20 to 25. It's not enough. It's, it's not enough to improve blood sugar control. It's not enough to improve hyperinsulinemia. You've got to get above 35 grams a day. And it's also very important to focus on viscous fiber. And viscous fiber is the kind of fiber that if you mix it with water, it becomes gluey. Okay, because it's the viscous fiber that helps with blood sugar control. And so what's, how do we know what's what? Well, basically, if you mix the fiber with water and it's gluey, it's the viscous or soluble fiber. So for example, oatmeal. If you leave oats at the bottom of your pot for the day, it's really gluey, isn't it? Flax seeds, mix ground flax with water, it gets really gluey. Mix wheat bran with water and it just absorbs the water. So it's, it's mostly 
the other kind of fiber, the, the, the non-viscous fiber, the insoluble fiber in wheat bran. So what we, what we do is we focus on legumes, barley, oats, flax seeds, to try to boost the soluble fiber or the viscous fiber in the diet. If you're going to get to 40, 50 grams of fiber a day, you don't have room for fiber-free foods. Okay, and the fiber-free foods are refined carbs, are very low in fiber, the white rice, white flour foods, and the absolutely fiber-free foods or zero fiber foods are meat, poultry, and fish, dairy products, sugar, and oil. And why are animal foods, why are they fiber-free? Well, fiber is actually the, the material that gives plants its, their structure. So that's what gives plants their shape and all of that. What gives animals their shape? Bones. No fiber in bones. The diet needs to be lower in fat, but the fat that is consumed needs to support health. Okay? High fat diets can be problematic for a number of reasons because fat is two and a half times more concentrated in calories than sugar or protein. Just a tablespoon of pure fat is 120 calories. So it, you can overeat very quickly using a lot of oils. Uh, it also increases oxidative damage in the body when you're eating a very high-fat diet, and it can contribute to insulin resistance. Total fat, we aim for 20 to 25% of calories, 40 to 50 grams of fat for most people, eating, say, 1,800 to 2,000 calories a day. Most fat that we use, that's where it comes from, whole foods. Why? It's very similar to the flour story, okay? Flour, you're taking out all the good stuff and you're left with the endosperm, just the starch. Oil, same story. You're removing the oil from a food and what are you leaving behind? You're leaving the antioxidants. You're leaving the fiber. You're leaving the phytochemicals. We want the diet to be very low in the bad fats. Saturated fats can be bad news because they increase cholesterol, bad cholesterol, and triglycerides. They trigger inflammation. Saturated fats can trigger inflammation. We can't have a lot of inflammation if we want to reverse insulin resistance. They reduce glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity, and they contribute to narrow, narrowing of the blood vessels and kidney disease, all not good things. So we keep the fat to basically the World Health Organization says 7% or less of calories should come from saturated fat. Our diet's probably closer to 5%, but it needs to be under 7%, which means about 13 grams in a 1,600-calorie diet. Half a can of Spam is 22 grams. Or an ounce of cheese is 9 grams. A glass of whole milk is 8 grams. And if you compare that to plant foods, the saturated fat in most plant foods is very low, with the exception of coconut. So we actually limit coconut oil. We don't use coconut oil, but we do allow for the use of coconut because it's an important traditional food. We encourage the use of the lower fat coconut products like the yew and the young coconut meat and so forth. No trans fatty acids. We eliminate trans fatty acids completely. Trans fatty acids come from shortening and partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. And there are plenty of those foods in the Marshall Islands, even though we're phasing out trans fatty acids in North America. Basically, the reasons why we don't want trans fatty acids is they get incorporated into our cell membranes. And when they do that, they affect the permeability, the shape, the flexibility, and the functioning of those cell membranes. And they make our cells stupid. They make them insulin resistant, and they make them stupid. They literally, effectively dumb down our cells. Of course, they also adversely affect our, our cholesterol levels. They also increase inflammation, so that's not good news either. So where do trans fatty acids come from? How much trans is contained in typical foods? Well, a three and a half ounce bag of microwave popcorn, about 7.5 grams. Can we want none? About five grams in a medium order of fries, 3.8 grams in one donut, 3.7 in one tablespoon of shortening. You can see you can go over the top pretty quickly. You've got to get rid of these products. And also, just to know that in the United States, if a product contains 0.5 grams of trans fatty acids per serving, it can be labeled trans-free. So we need to make sure there's enough 
omega-3 fatty acids because omega-3s actually improve the fluidity of cell membranes, increasing their sensitivity to insulin. So this is important. So we include plant sources of omega-3s like flax seeds and walnuts, at least three grams of omega-3s in the daily diet, and we provide that in our program with flax seeds and walnuts. We need the diet to be very high in phytochemicals and antioxidants. Okay, and the reason being that people with diabetes tend to have very low levels of antioxidants. So how do you do this? Well, to improve antioxidants, you need to be eating fruits and veggies. You also need to be eating the legumes, the nuts and seeds, and if you're using grains, they need to be whole grains. So lots of these foods. A lot of people say, well, can't I just use supplements? And the answer is, please don't do that. Well, first of all, people in the Marshall Islands can't afford those kinds of supplements. But for people here, some of them that can afford to use the supplements, it's not a good idea because a number of of, of studies have been done looking at using just a beta carotene, for example. And what we found is actually the problems can outweigh the benefits. And, and it happened with vitamin E and it happened with beta carotene. There's not a single carotenoid. There's 50 or 60 carotenoids that you'd eat normally from fruits and vegetables. If you load your system up with one, it may actually inhibit the absorption of the others. Same with vitamin E. Okay, there are all kinds of different types of vitamin E, and you take one manufactured alpha-tocopherol, and it can keep out, out the types of, of tocotrienols and other tocopherols that your body actually needs. So, so don't do that. We also need to look at what are the things causing the oxidative damage, the pro-oxidants. We need to get rid of them. We need to cut them out. So what are the worst offenders here? They're food contaminants like pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and hormones and heavy metals and the what we call POPs or persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and DDTs and dioxins. Uh, oxidized fats like rancid fats and fats that are cooked at high temperatures. If an oil smokes when you heat it, you're getting products of oxidation forming that are very damaging to human health. This is a, just a list of advanced glycation end products, and the top of the list are broiled or barbecued frankfurters. Then you've got, you've got grilled meat and fish and poultry, but I want to show you that even grilling tofu, you can produce some of these compounds as well. Fruits and vegetables naturally contain a little bit of AGEs, but very minimal in comparison to the processed meats that are cooked at high temperatures. The diet is also moderate in salt or sodium. Where is most of the salt we eat? Processed foods. And if you take a look at things like ramen noodles, 1,434 milligrams of sodium in one pack. Just loaded. Two ounces of Spam, 767. A, a can of sardines, 465. A teaspoon of soy sauce, 310. It's, but when you mix it into a batter like cornflakes and then you make these flakes, you barely even taste it because it's consistently right through the product, even though the product is very, very salty. So processed foods are where we get most of the sodium we eat. So what does the diet actually look like? Well, for breakfast, we eat beans and greens, or we eat barley with fruit and nuts and seeds, and soy milk instead of why, and some people say, well, why soy milk instead of cow's milk? Two reasons. One is that most Marshallese are lactose intolerant. Second reason, animal proteins are pro-inflammatory. If we want to reverse diabetes, we need to get the inflammatory proteins out of the diet. That simple. Lunch is generally a bean soup and a salad. Dinner, this is a big salad bar, one of the very typical things we provide for dinner. But we also do things like more traditional foods like a kalal with coconut milk that we squeeze from fresh coconut and we use the local pumpkin and we use the local greens and, and instead of meat we use garbanzo beans. We do cooking classes and the cooking classes we don't just show people how to cook things. We actually have them cooking them with us. We do shopping tours to help people to know where and how to select healthy foods in the grocery stores that are in their hometown. We partnered with the local grocery stores and we've, they've changed their buying practices considerably because of that. We have really looked at the problem of affordable produce because this is a huge problem. People who make $2 an hour can't afford to pay $2 a pound for apples. 
Local farming is actually quite limited, but the growing season is year-round, sunshine is very plentiful, so we're teaching people how to grow their own food. And what we do is we actually have partnered with the local, local agriculture experts and get them to come to our clinic and teach people how to grow foods. And we actually get some of the local Marshallese agriculture experts to go to the homes of our participants. And if they don't have enough room for gardens, we teach them how to plant foods in earth boxes. Exercise is critical to reversing diabetes, absolutely critical. And so we have people walking three times a day during the intensive phase and at least twice a day non-intensive. We do aerobics classes with the women, we do box circuit training classes with the men, we have people using cardio machines, resistance training with weights and bands. Here you see the ladies walking. You know, when we arrived in Madro, there was some sort of um, taboo against walking, it seemed. And here you see the uh, dance aerobics classes. The ladies love it, and we have so much fun. One thing about the Marshallese people is almost everything we do is fun. They laugh all the time, and they enjoy themselves so much. So uh, education sessions, we do talk about lifestyle and chronic disease, food and nutrition, gardening, exercise, stress management. Uh, healthy lifestyle choices, dental health, care of eyes and teeth, but we get various experts coming in. And actually we've transitioned the, the program now to be completely taught in Marshallese. In the first two weeks, participants report, number one, their pain disappears. And, and it's, it's really quite shocking because some of them have been having intermittent claudication in their legs where they get such bad leg cramps that they can hardly walk at night time. They wake up several times at night and have to get their partners to massage their legs because it's so painful. In two weeks, in almost all of our patients, that is completely gone. They have greatly increased energy. Walking becomes easier. They no longer have to get up 12 times during the night to go to the bathroom. And they're no longer constipated, needless to say. They lose, on average, 5.2 pounds in two weeks. Their blood sugar drops, on average, 75 milligrams per deciliter in two weeks. Their cholesterol drops, on average, 33 milligrams per deciliter in two weeks. And their triglycerides, 42.5 milligram per deciliter drop, on average, in the first two groups. Post two weeks is a different story. Some people, unbelievably, they just keep doing better and better and better until their diabetes is gone completely. Other people, after the first three months especially, they'll go home, they've got such a huge family to feed, they don't know how to continue on the program on their own. So what we're seeing is the people that have enough money do really well, the people that have no money don't do as well. And we are desperately trying to figure out how to solve that problem. Uh, and changes in medications, unbelievable. We had three people on insulin in the first two weeks, zero. They had to stop. They were getting hypoglycemic. 27 people on oral agents, down to five after two weeks. 13 on cholesterol-lowering meds, down to one after two weeks. Antihypertensives from 11 to one after two weeks. So uh, now I just want to share a little bit about our very, a few participants that I happen to have quotes from. I wish I would have had more just on hand, so much of the data is still in the Marshall Islands, but I had quotes from a few participants and I thought you would be interested in hearing their stories. This is Marie Madison. She says, when I joined, I couldn't lift my hands above my head without significant pain. Now I'm pain-free. My cholesterol and triglycerides have dropped to normal. My sugars are almost normal, too. I've lost weight, and I feel like a new person. I'm off all medications. It's unbelievable. This is Lorak Lorak. He said, my pilot's medical certificate was denied when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I'm 38 years old. I was devastated, as this certificate is necessary for my work as a pilot. I heard about the diabetes wellness program and became a participant. I completely changed my diet and began a daily exercise program. Upon my last physical checkup, I was told that I'm fully recovered and my pilot's medical certificate was approved. My fasting sugar is below 90 milligrams per deciliter. I no longer have diabetes. I have my career and my life back. 
And this is Tina Arkeona. Tina said, I, when I joined the program, I was very skeptical. That's an understatement. <laughs> she, was, she was our most skeptical of all. She just didn't believe this could work. She believed it was radiation and this could not work. But very quickly, I started to feel better. The cramps in my legs disappeared and I no longer had to get up during the night to go to the bathroom. My sugars kept dropping and are now normal without any medication. My last lab test showed I'm no longer diabetic. People can hardly believe what has happened to me. TNAR's A1C went from, I believe it was 8.8 .8 to 5.6. And A1C is a sort of a three-month measure of, of blood sugar control. Anything under seven is, is considered excellent. Anything under six, you're really not diabetic <laughs> if, you don't, if you're not on medication. So her fasting sugar is below 90 now. She's not diabetic anymore. And finally, this is Morrison. He said, I was diagnosed with diabetes in 1994. I had to take pills every day. My weight kept going up, as did my blood glucose level. I joined the diabetes wellness program, and I feel great now. I have no more pain, no more sleepless nights, no more cravings for unhealthy food. I have a whole different outlook on what I put into my body. I pray that the diabetes wellness program will continue until all people with diabetes feel as well as I do. He says, I'm 57 years old, but I feel like I'm 18. You know, the people of the Marshall Islands are actually the pioneers of the Pacific. They, the participants in the program are providing hope to people amid, I think, a deep sense of hopelessness, especially for many years. Diabetes was always seen as a rapid downhill escalation in health, from diagnosis to getting limbs cut off to dying. And they had never actually witnessed people actually getting better with diabetes. They have managed to overcome what, what would be seemingly insurmountable mountains of spam and donuts and ramen noodles and cola. Unbelievable. They've put together low-cost, healthy meals, despite the high cost and poor quality of the produce, the, despite the lack of kitchen implements and appliances. And some people say to me, could it work at home? And all I can say is, if there's hope in the Marshall Islands, considering the barriers that they face, there's got to be hope for the rest of the world. You know, it's, it's really important for people to understand that we have a very large, convincing body of evidence that suggests that the very diseases that are filling our doctor's offices, our hospital beds, and our graveyards are lifestyle-induced. It is estimated that up to 90% of heart disease and type 2 diabetes and 60 to 70% of cancers are entirely preventable. There's also a very large and convincing body of evidence that suggests that diet and lifestyle intervention is the safest, most economical and effective way of treating these diseases once they do occur. There are no medications, there are no surgeries that can effectively reverse lifestyle-induced diseases because they don't get to the root of the problem. The only thing that will ever, has ever, reversed lifestyle-induced diseases is profound lifestyle changes. And 5% is not enough. Our traditional mainstream therapy where you lower fat a little and you eat take the skin off your chicken. It will not do the trick to reverse these diseases. It may help slow complications. It may help control blood sugars. It will not reverse insulin resistance. The bottom line is that there is no doctor, there is no dietitian, and there is no alternative health care provider that controls what you put in your mouth and how much you move your body. Only you can make those choices. You are in control. You need to be the captain of your own ship. The good news is that I leave on Wednesday to do an intervention for the Nidigella, the heads of state, the politicians. Okay? And I am going to try my very best to convince the Nidigella that maybe some political changes like taking tax off of fruits and vegetables and putting more on spam and 
soda pop would help. Uh, we'll, we'll try our very best. Uh, we're going to publish the research very shortly, and we have lost our funding completely. The DOD has taken all of their health funding uh, has been axed. Uh, what we're hoping is that the Ministry of Health, we will transition the program to the Ministry of Health and we will provide, Canvas back will put out their own funds and try to support them in every way we can. I will continue going back a couple of two, three times a year to help support them. You know how I got involved in this program to start with? Is the medical director for this program had just been to a conference where I presented five lectures one of them was on defeating diabetes. He bought this book and he said to Canvasback, this is the program we need to follow. And so they called me and said, can you help us? And I said, I got a book due and you know lectures all over the place. Sure, no problem. <laughs> I, ca I postponed the book. I canceled almost all my lectures that I could. And my husband took a six month leave of absence. But you know how, how it actually happened is my son said to us, when I said, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can change my schedule. He said, Mom, if you're not going, I'm going without you. So he's the one that started the men's fitness program and ordered all the equipment and got it all going. We need to make politicians aware. We need to put pressure on the government so that things start to happen. We need to do work within our local schools and our local communities to, to try to get people more aware. And, and one of the best ways to make a difference, I believe, is by our own personal example. If you're a person with diabetes and you're able to get it reversed with, with a, a dramatic change in lifestyle, that will say more than any person standing up talking could ever say. It's so important to set the example of what health can be. Como tada. That's thank you in Marshall. Oh, <laughs> Well, um, I th we've, we've heard a very impressive lecture just now, one of our very best. And please come again next month. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.